Hello to all, Nick Asayan, CO, Light Helmets. We're here for another episode of Light Impact, Season 2, Episode 7, and I have a true American hero sitting next to me today. Yes, the man, the legend, the one that potentially saved youth football in California, fought the government and won, Steve Famiano. Steve, thanks for being here. Oh, great to be here, Nick. Great to be here. Now, this is big stuff. So uh, did this decision get made yesterday or the day before? This decision was made on Monday. Okay. So in layman's terms, I'm going to say what happened, and then we're going to dig into this stuff. So I've known Steve for uh, the distance, what, two, three years now? Four years? Yeah, yeah. So maybe even a little longer than that. So a bill was proposed in the state of California that would – eliminate or highly, highly, highly regulate tackle football for kids. And this has not happened once, but it's happened twice. Once back in 2018. Yes. AB 2108. And once, uh, obviously, it just ended or didn't end, but got deferred um, a couple days ago, AB 734. Now, I'm going to talk more about why I think this is a bad idea from my personal experience taking off the business hat and then business hat on too. But the first thing before we even start, I'll probably thank you again at the end, nice work on this because I think a lot of kids won based on the work that you did. Kids won that don't even play football yet and parents won. So thanks for your efforts up front. Um, talk us through First, this AB 734, exactly what was it? Because I'm sure I did a disservice to really what it was, how I explained it. Yeah, so, <clears throat> excuse me there. This AB 734 is no different than the bill that you referred to, 2108, in 2018. This is a five-year-long process that I've personally been involved with. So I'm going to try and give you the, the history of how, why even we're here discussing this, right? So this started back in 2018 with the assembly member Kevin McCarty, who is a uh, assembly member that represents Sacramento area. So back in 2018, him along with a former assembly person, Lorena Gonzalez Fletcher, who is out of the San Diego area, co-sponsored this I bill. Know, I know her well. Okay, 2108, which would have done the same thing that AB 734 would have done, stop kids under 12 from playing tackle football in California. And that's when I got involved in 2018. The interesting part of this story that a lot of people don't understand how this happened, and this, this is a very unique part of this story. So when I saw the news headline back in 2018, I just thought, man, I got to do something. I didn't know what I needed to do at that moment when I read that headline back in February of 2018, but I got home that night, took my laptop out, and I said, you know what? How do I get the word out? So I said, I'm going to make a Facebook group. Sat on my computer at my kitchen table. I said, okay, how am I going to do this? What am I going to call this thing? What do we call this? Save football, save California football. And finally, I just said, save youth football dash California. Created that name, created that group. Before you know it, we had 100 people in the group, 1,000 people in the group, 2,000. And then ultimately, at one time back in 2018, we had close to 15,000 members. Wow, that's remarkable. Unbelievable, right? Starting from scratch. So I started that group. I had seen another news headline where there was a guy that had created a petition to go against 2108. And I went, hmm, I need to get a hold of this guy. So reached out on Facebook. His name is Jason Ingman. He lives up in Northern California from the Rockland area. And reached out to him, sent him a message, said, hey, we need to hook up. You know, maybe we can start something here. You got that petition. I got this Facebook group. Next thing you know, about a week later, I saw another news article that had a guy's name in there named Chris Four. Didn't know that Chris actually lived in Apple Valley where I lived currently. So I reached out to Chris and I said, hey, Chris, I saw they comp they interviewed you for this um, band bill. Um, what is your involvement in this? He said, oh, I'm just a high school guy that is involved in high school football. And I was trying to get the word out and you know I had some connections. So I said, well, hey, let's get together. Let's see what we can do. We, we got to try to rally the troops, right? So. Chris had contacted USA Football and some of the other national organizations, Pop Warner, AYF, got this conference call together back, I think it was about the uh, third week of February 2018, 
on that call, there were 40 of us. USA football, everybody that was involved in youth football, high school guys, just a lot of different people. And we had all agreed to come back the next week, do another conference call. We come back the next week, there were eight of us on the call the next week. We went from 40 people down to eight. And a lot of people just dropped off and disappeared. What Do you think that it's the typical, hey, you know, let's get together. You at the Christmas party and then you never see the person again. <laughs> or was this people like, oh, shit, I don't want to get involved in this because it's going to become, I don't want to jump on a, a sinking ship if we're going to lose this. What, what were your thoughts? Why do you think people step back? No, that's great you say that, Nick, sinking ship, because I, I honestly, over this experience, I'm starting to learn that I think that that's part of the mentality, right? Oh, I, I just don't want to touch this. I don't want to get involved in this, right? I just, uh, somebody else can handle it for me. And so that second call, we had eight of us, and then the eight of us agreed to come back the following week. So we came back the following week, and there was five of us left. It was myself, Joe Rafter, Ron White, Jason Ingman, and a gentleman in Northern California named Todd Bloomstein. So the five of us became the Save Youth Football California Coalition back in 2018. Um, all grassroots took us 12 weeks. We had this detailed plan and we beat the bill in 2018. And, you know, we thought back then maybe we were done with this, right? We didn't really think we'd be back five years later, but here we are. Yeah. So I think back in 20, late 2018, if I'm not wrong, your group contacted us. We had some uh, this is pre-pandemic, obviously, discussion. And I think our chief operating officer, Justin Burt, went up and spoke in Sacramento in, in defense of youth football and pushed back on this bill. And he was just one small, you know, molecule of mortar and all the bricks that you guys had put together. But uh, I find it remarkable that you guys, five people that probably didn't know each other in advance. or No, we didn't. You didn't managed to do this. How much money do you think you guys spent personally fighting? So you don't have to give me an exact dollar amount, but uh, it got into the thousand dollar range. I mean, thousands of dollars yeah. range, right? Personal money. Because you're traveling and you have yeah. Facebook pages and marketing and buying ad space and all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, all of that. So, you know, when I look at this, why does the state feel that, or the state of California, now let me preface this by a lot of people think, Oh my God, California is all a bunch of left-wing loons, and uh, you know there there's no balance there, and that's true in some areas, right? Um, I mean, if you walk through downtown San Francisco, tech exec got stabbed there the other day. Nobody stole anything from him; just random stabbing, right? People yeah. can crap in the street. You can go to a Walgreens and steal nine hundred ninety-nine dollars and ninety-nine cents worth of stuff, and walk out and not worry about what's going to happen. That's not how San Diego works or Central California works for the most part. But who is who pressed this into the legislature to begin with? Like, why would somebody say, well, you know, 100,000 people died from fentanyl in the United States this last year coming across the border. We're not going to worry about that problem. Um, we're not going to worry about, you know, some of the cities being on fire. Let's ban youth football. Like, where does that come from? Yeah, so that that's a very deep story. So... Prior to 2018, I had no clue really who Chris Nowinski was. And I come to find out that he had been a WWE wrestler and, and I think he played college football somewhere. I don't really pay too much attention to Chris Nowinski, but Chris Nowinski is the head of the Concussion Legacy Foundation. And it's a organization that promotes basically protecting people in sports from concussions and head injuries, which I think that's a great thing. It's right? an admirable cause. Right? Yeah. yeah, right. I mean, that's, that is a great thing. But part of their, part of their goal and, and Chris Nowinski's goal is for whatever reason, and you have to ask Chris Nowinski this because he's the only one that can really answer this, why he believes that kids under a certain age shouldn't play youth tackle football but should be out on you know a soccer field or a rugby field or a dirt bike or something being injured sure you know, because we know kids just don't play youth football yeah yeah right? girls flag girls soccer is the yeah. most highly concussed sport in the united states it's huge right yeah. and and so that's a question for him, but he is the guy that is pushing all of this legislation. So if you see in New York, New York's going through this too right now. He's the guy that goes out and 
The only way I can look at this is he finds a lawmaker that he can convince, right? Like he finds, he's finding that one. And I hate to say that it's a weak lawmaker, but to me, that's what it seems like. It's a weak lawmaker that's not doing their research, not not understanding the other aspect of this. Sure. And Nowinski gets in the guy's ear or the gal's ear and says, oh, this is, these kids are being, you know, they're being killed on the football field or whatever he's telling them. Right. And he's getting these lawmakers to write these bills to ban youth football. These lawmakers are not doing this on their own. Yeah. They're yeah. not. It's getting brought on their radar. And then yes. it's painted as, hey, you're going to be a hero for protecting these kids. And of course, as a politician, you usually can't make it in the private sector. So this is your way of sticking your flag in the ground. And, yeah. uh, you know, th- th- it's sad that, that we're dealing with this, but you think about all the stuff, all the social ills that we're facing as a country right now, right? I mean, social media is so hard on these kids. And what did they have to do for two years while they were sitting inside in the pandemic? Like the fatality rate for COVID was next to nothing if you're under 18 years old. And these kids are stuck and you're judging yourself against the filter of what everyone else is putting up. I'm 55 years old in my social media. I don't have a picture of me waking up in the morning with, you know, my hair, you know, as a bush and wearing a (laughs) T-shirt and you put your best foot forward. And it's hard on kids. It's hard on kids that they didn't get to go to school. It's hard on kids that they have to face. Hey, guess what? Somebody in a G string is going to be brought into your classroom and dance around you. And you're like, what the hell is going on here? I want to learn about you know, X, Y, and Z, um, and more or less, oh, you can't play football. You can't go do this. You can't go and do that. But the things that are going on right now in the schools, things that are going on with kids, I look at as football is part of the solution. It's not part of the problem. And it is. It's it, part of the solution. It's it's a struggle for me when these politicians are pushing things into the school and then pulling out things out of the school like I think the number right now is about 5.4 million people play tackle football in the United States. Yeah, it's pretty close. So, you know, out of all of those people, and it used to be almost, I think, 7.5 million people, it's not like people are just walking around drooling. There is a issue with repetitive concussions when you have not been reset to zero and gone through the right therapy to recover properly. And, you know, we'll talk a little bit more on the political side, but I want to jump to something that you guys did between... 2018 and current, and that is AB1. Tell, tell me what that was and is. Great. So after the 2018 ban bill, after we defeated that, we just said goodbye. We thought we were, we were good there. Myself, Joe Rafter, and Ron White, the three guys of the five, we wanted to continue to do this work. And we, we, we were kind of like throwing some ideas around saying, how could we do this? Like what? How can we not walk away from this issue and show that we really are not here just to stop bills and and stop these bans? How can we improve youth tackle football in California? So we we spent one weekend in Ventura, had a guy's weekend, you know, drank some cold ones, did a lot of talking, and we decided to start the California Youth Football Alliance, 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to honoring, improving, and advancing youth football in California. And... What we did was we started kind of taking some of the amendments that we had given the committee back in 2018 on what what can we do, um, you know, medical on the field, reducing contact, different things like that. So we started writing a bill, basically. We didn't know how to really do that, but we started putting it together. Back in 2018, we had one assembly member, Jim Cooper, who is a Democrat out of the Elk Grove area. He's now the Sacramento County Sheriff. He's out of Sacramento. He supported us. He came to the rally we had and he said, I support youth football. I, I want to work with you guys. He found out that we had started the alliance and said, hey, I hear you guys are working on some stuff. Let's meet. Let's get together. Let's make this happen. We we're like, sure. We don't know how to do this process. You do. Sure. So he became the author of the bill, which is the California Youth Football Act, AB1. Went through the assembly, the Senate, passed. Nobody opposed it because why would you oppose safety for kids, sure. right? That's yeah. it's a great thing. Governor Newsom signed it in 2019. It became law. And it is the nation's. This is, and I think we haven't done personally a good job of getting this word out. This is the nation's only youth sports safety bill that is comprehensive and sets standards above any other youth sport in the country. 
not just California. So talk a little bit about, you know, give me an example. Like, uh, you know, as a layman, I'm like, okay, there's no more Oklahoma drills. So you're not lining up head to head 10 yards from each other and running, you know, full speed at each other 15 times in a row. But go, go into a little detail on what did you guys put in this thing? So, yeah, it's great. You talk about all those drills, right, that we used to do. I used to do back in the 80s when I played youth football in Imperial Beach, right? You know, yep. um, it's a lot different from what happened in the 1980s. So one of the biggest things that we did in the bill, and this is based upon CDC recommendations and other medical entity recommendations and different studies that have been done, that reducing contact reduces concussions, right? Of course it does. That's just a no-brainer. So we added into that bill that youth football organizations in California can do no more than 60 minutes a week of full contact practice. So what that does is, you know, you can do a lot of air practice or the bags and things like that. None of this full contact for eight, 10 hours a week, yeah. right? And, and I know that used to happen back in the days in youth football. I'm not going to hide from that. Never going to hide from something that used to happen because that stuff did. When I played in the 80s, I was lucky to get water. Sure. Yeah, right? they wouldn't give us water. You had to right. put gator gum in your helmet so you could right. chew it and try to try to, try to to make it through the day. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, I mean, and even back in the day in the 1980s, I mean, it's, it's kind of embarrassing now to think about this stuff happening, but they used to put trash bags around kids and then get them to lose weight and stuff, right? Yeah. So yeah. we're not doing that. Yeah. We're, we're, we're being responsible adults and responsible coaches and, and putting standards around a sport that, um, and not only youth football, you know, Nick, this is important for people to understand. Youth football is, in my opinion, the safest sport to play in California right now if, if, if you want to sign your kid up for a sport. Because of AB1, we have EMTs on the field for game day, which not only help the players, they help the parents in the stands. Sure. I don't know how many people have had to call an ambulance because grandma got overheated during a game on a Saturday. Right. And you're waiting for an ambulance. Sure. So now... You're safe at a game because you have medical on the field. We're reducing contact. All the coaches have to be CPR certified, AED. AEDs have to be on the field. Your child is in a very safe environment if they play youth football in California for those leagues that are following the law. I know there are some that probably don't. I can't, I can't guarantee that 100% of youth football organizations are following the law. But for those organizations that are, way safer than any other sport. I, I attended... Uh, Good friend of mine, this kid played youth football, uh, sorry, youth basketball for the town league. <laughs> they didn't even have a first aid kit. Wow. They didn't That's have a first crazy. aid kit. Can you believe, I mean, they didn't even have a first aid kit. And I remember him telling me, he said, Steve, why aren't you pushing to have AB1 be implemented in other sports? So well, that's kind of the goal, but it's a long process to do that. Because, you know, once we start pushing that on other sports... Then you get the soccer guy coming back. Oh, I don't want to do that. Right, 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 right. Because, you know, and to some people it adds cost. And um, Yes, I get that. And, and I think proof is that you had bipartisan support of this, right? Yeah. This is not like a Republican thing or a Democrat thing or Libertarian or whatever. You had people from both sides supporting this and putting some structure to it. And if you look at the country, right, it's developed over time and it continues to be refined. But squelching things, that's not refinement. That's just eliminating it. And, True. Uh, you know, so I think that and, and I've coached youth football before when my son was playing. I didn't coach him specifically, but he was on the team and you're engaging these kids. And when I think back to when I played Man, I mean, we were fine, but you were beating the hell out of each other every practice and the tackling drills and over and over and over and over and over. And the AB1 and the principles that you guys put in place are great. And I think it'd be uh, posi a positive if other states would, would look at this. But, of course, nobody wants to – you did it as a reaction to something that could yes, eliminate the sport. That's true. Other states, maybe they take it up if somebody does that there. Now, something like this is going on in New York right now as well. What other states are looking at uh, making youth football you know, a thing of the past? That's it right now. I mean, back – in 2018, well, actually, before even California, there was Illinois. Illinois was the first state that, that had this happen. Um, but those other states have been kind of off the table for now. So it's New York and California. Yep. Um, you know, two of the biggest states, right? So sure. So if you can get one of those, I don't think other states are going to follow. That's just my personal opinion. Yeah. I think it's a ridiculous thing to even do. 
And I think Sacramento is 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 somewhat realizing that now. I mean, how many times are we going to, you know, when's AB 900 going to come in two years, right? Like, how, right. how many times are we going to continue to do this? Yeah. yeah. You know? No, it's interesting. You know, there's a, there was a law passed, and I don't remember what year it goes in place. It may already be in place, but you can't buy a dirt bike with a red sticker. And if you're from out of the state of California, red sticker dirt bikes when you drive on the track or ride on the track. A green sticker means you can ride it on public lands. And so if you're a kid that races dirt bikes, you know, what are you going to do? And yeah. the, I think the government overreach thing, you know, obviously in some areas that they need to do a better job and in other places. And this is still the greatest place on the planet to live. But uh, people have to push back because if no one would have taken up uh, the cause like you guys did, what are all these kids going to do, right? They're going to play flag football, soccer, whatever else. And I want to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, my, I, I can share my observations later, I'm, but I'm on this show all the time, so nobody wants to hear me talk. But <laughs> what do you see as the impact or the effect of football on kids? Because I think football provides, you know, grit, perseverance, goal setting, all these different things. What do you see? Give me some examples because you've been around it for a lot for longer than I have. Long time. I, I've been involved in youth football for twenty plus years. Um, five years just doing the save youth football stuff. Um, you know, where I'm at in Apple Valley, um, we're about seventy five thousand population. You know, a small desert town would be considered a small desert town. It's even called the town of Apple Valley. It's not even considered a city. It's called the town. So. You know, there's not a lot of things for kids to do in, in, in an area like where I'm at. You know, there's you know, there's soccer, baseball and all that stuff, but you know, if 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 you take away a sport like football, you're not gonna get the same experience as you would on a baseball field. You know, and, and it's hard to explain that to people sometimes unless they directly get involved with the sport to understand what we mean by that. Because in football, when you have 11 guys on that one side, on that offensive side, all 11 players matter. Yeah, they all have to do their job. Right? Right. All 11 players matter. Like when you're playing baseball, and you joke about this. My boys did Little League. I coached Little League with them. If your kid plays the outfield in Little League, I feel sorry for him. Right. <laughs> so get, well, right. They're not getting the action that you will as part of football. Sure. You know, we always joke about them picking daisies out in the outfield, waiting for a ball to get hit to them, right? Yep. What are they learning from that experience? Right. They're not. They're not learning as much as you can from football. Football is such an intricate sport to where every player has a part. That, that to me, is huge, right? Because no, no different than, you know, the company that you have, right? Or if, if you own a business and you're running a business, every person has a part, where do you learn these things from? Sure. You may learn them from your parents. You may not. But it's good to have that neutral coach or that team mom that's involved with that sport help you, too, to become a better person. And the sport of football is like no other sport. Because every time that ball is snapped, offense or defense, everyone is part of that play. That's true. It's it's the ultimate team sport. There's no, and people say, what do you mean the ultimate team sport? It's the ultimate team sport. It just is. You 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 can't be the offensive guard and not be part of that play because your blocking assignment matters to that play. Yeah. You know, you can't just stand back and let the other guy do all the work for you. Sure. It's you know? true. It's true. I, uh, the way I've explained it to people from my perspective is you have all these small goals and it may be. I, I got to show up for practice every day on time right. or I'm going to run and my team's going to run. Um, I've got to make this block on this play that is, uh, you know, jet sweep right, X, Y, Z, one, two, three, you know. It. And if you don't make that block, the group of 11 fails. The guys that are waiting to come in on defense, special team, they fail even though that they're, they're watching, they're waiting. It impacts yeah. everyone. And then, you know, that leads to a score, that leads to the win. And nobody really cares if a kid is – what race, color, creed they are in a huddle. I mean, it, when I played Pop Warner football in the late 70s and in the 80s, I played high school football in the late 80s and a little bit of college football. Race isn't a factor on the football field. It just really is not. And being a 100% Armenian guy was probably one of the, the smallest, you know, <laughs> minorities that were out there. But 
football for me was, hey, you show up as a 100-pound kid in high school, and you kind of got to earn your stripes, and then all of a sudden you're like, this is my group of guys, but it shows emotional control, goal setting, all of these other things. And the other sports are good sports, but they're different. Each sport yeah, teaches different. you something different. Um, now, we're seeing more and more females playing tackle football, too. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think that it's fantastic. And, you know, hey, the rules are the rules. You're coming out and you're playing. And whatever position you are, you're just you're one of the players on the team. And I think that's fantastic. What do you see as uh, the next hurdle in this fight in California for you? What's going on with this AB 734 didn't go away, uh, from what I understand? Yeah, so basically what happened this time in, in I'm pretty humble in this, and I try to stay as humble as I can because, and I appreciate how you introduced me in the beginning of this, but this is a team effort also, right? This is, this is I couldn't do this alone, and this happens because of the youth football community and the high school football community in California. I mean, I might be helping lead it and direct it, but I could not do this without the support of those moms, dads, coaches, high school head coaches, without their support and their backlash against Sacramento, this thing would have probably been voted yes on in committee. But because of the work that we've done, they realize, uh uh-oh, uh-oh, we got a lot of people, you know, pissed off, honestly. And I've said that to committee members' offices. There's a lot of anger out here that we're dealing with this. Yeah. So this bill basically is, I would call it sleep mode. So currently, as of today, AB 734 is in sleep mode. It's still in the committee, but they're not going to vote on it, which is a good thing. Sure. So we we stopped it from being voted on, which is huge because that pushes that bill back a little bit. So what's going to happen sometime in the fall, and we don't know the month or the date yet, this committee is going to hold a informational hearing, something I just learned. This is new to me because I'm not that deeply involved in all this politics stuff. So what they're going to do is they're going to take this bill. We're going to do a hearing in the fall. The author side, you know, could be Chris Nowinski showing up. I don't know who he's going to bring. And our side will have experts come in. Of course, they're going to be medical experts discussing CTE, concussions, and everything else. And the committee is going to ask questions. So it's going to be an educational type, you know, experience for everybody. And I, I think, my gut, my opinion is, once the committee hears the other side, and not just the headlines, you know, 99 of 100 NFL players. And, you know, we've all seen it, right? We've all seen the headlines. I think that bill is going to go nowhere in the fall. I don't see it coming back. Because if it does come back, I- I'm going to be back, right? Sure. I'm not going anywhere. And yeah. that's the thing that I told Sacramento. We're not going anywhere. Youth football families are here. We're sure. not going anywhere. We're California voters. Chris Nowinski is not a California voter. Keep his rear end wherever he needs to keep his <laughs> rear end. And it's it, it's true, though, right? It's it's like we, we're your voters. We're your constituents. Right. You need to listen to us, not people from outside of the state of California. Yeah. That's, that's yeah, where no, I'm at. Yeah, no, true. I, I think one of the big things, if I take my light hat off for a second, is I got two kids, a 19-year-old and a 17-year-old. And uh, I want to make that decision with my with their mom and my kids on what sport they're going to play. I don't want somebody to eliminate that as an option. Yeah. Like my younger son, he he you know he played hockey for a long time, and you know he wanted to make a change. He I don't know if he was burned out or he lost a passion for it. He just didn't want to play anymore. And it was where was he going to go? And he wanted to play f- football, and it built his confidence. Uh, it gave him focus. You know, here's this high school kid that's showing up to school five fifteen in the morning with all of his his buddies, right? All of his brothers. They're at lift. They're running in the rain. They're doing the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And if you choose not to do that, that's great, right? To each their own. Um, But this is not like, hey, let's jump motocross bikes off the edge of the Grand Canyon and see what happens. (laughs) I mean, we've been playing football for a long time. That doesn't mean it was managed right because it wasn't, right? Auto racing wasn't managed right. Boot camps in the military weren't managed right. Um, People did hurtful things physically, mentally. They say things that you should never be able to say to a kid. But those are things of the past. And I agree. When you look at now the equipment, I think we have the best headgear, but helmet. Ah, sorry, had to do it. <laughs> but the turf, the 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 coaching, the, the concussion 
diagnostic tools that are available, all of these different things. And um, all of the sports need some microscope on them. Nothing can go unregulated because when it That's goes true. unregulated, the sharks come out and take things over, right? That's right. And whether it's, you know, you look at soccer and it's like, man, I mean, uh, especially girls soccer, like it's it's rough and the concussion rate is high. And, you know, should they all be wearing headgear? Well, it takes heading out of the game. You know, that's a big decision. I, I'm i not one to, I don't want to be involved in that discussion, but I don't think no, they I should didn't. make soccer but, illegal, right? No. And, and, you know, it's funny. So um, I look at it, this is a spin that I don't think Sacramento can answer and it puts them on the spot. So if, if you're a lawmaker and you're willing to eliminate a youth sport, you should be willing to write a bill. And I, I challenge any lawmaker in Sacramento to write a bill that forces kids to play sports. Think about that from an opposite right, direction, right, right? Right. Why aren't we forcing kids to get off the video games yeah. and get off the cell phones and get out and be active? Sure. So, there's nobody in Sacramento that's going to write a bill that would force kids to play at least one sport a year. They're not going to do that. So if you're not going to do that, why are you even thinking about eliminating something? we got to get these kids. You talked about COVID and everything else. We have got to get these kids more active, not less active. Sure. And, and once you eliminate one option, whether it's for concussions, whatever you want to, whatever you want to call it, you're going to have to look at other sports. Sure. We're opening up a Pandora's box yeah. by by doing this. If if you put legisl any state, any state that makes legislation to eliminate a youth sport for a safety risk, it's all off. It's all on the table, and it's going to be all off the table. To be honest with you, Nick. So you know, I've seen these news stories that have come along, and they'll say, "Oh, you know, at, at ninety some percent of uh, players in the NFL um, in post mortem uh, are are." diagnosed with some form of CT or TBI, et cetera. But there's no control group, right? Like if you took a bunch of other people of the of the same age bracket that had the same income bracket that grew up during the same period of time that never played football, nobody looked at that group to say, is it 90 some percent there? Because I fell off my bike and my brother hit me in the head with the pillow and X, Y, and Z. Like, <laughs> Was there science behind what these opponents of youth football were promoting or was it more uh, what they were trying to sell as a common sense factor? What, what, what was your gut? So what I've learned, yeah, look, I'm not a doctor. I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to even try and play one on TV or whatever, but from what I've learned over these past five years, you're right. The science is very limited when it comes to CTE, if that's going to be the discussion about youth football. Yeah. There has never been that I know of, unless there's a study out there somewhere that I haven't seen, where a child that has played only youth football has wound up with CTE. It's always been somebody that's been at the NFL level. Sure. And it's mostly been American football players yeah. and men. Yeah. There hasn't been any CT research on women. So there's no right? contrast yet. There's no, we don't know. Yeah. We don't What's going to happen when women's soccer players start showing up with CTE if that happens? Yeah. I mean, what are we doing here, right? That's why we can have all the science in the world to tell us, right? I mean, you know that if you put your child on a bike and he goes right in the street, he's probably going to get hit by a car if he's not paying attention. But we're not banning kids from riding in the street right. on bikes. Right. Where, where do we draw this risk line? And that's what we're talking about here. To me, it's not even about CTE anymore. I mean, if that's what they want to push for banning youth football, that's fine. Go ahead and push that. But I look at it this way. We've known for years concussion is a risk, right? There's nothing, nobody's going to say that concussion is not a risk of playing youth sports. Sure. Why now, because of this one new risk that is not really medically agreed upon, that we're going to start eliminating sports now sure. for it? Sure. I, I, I don't agree with it. I think it's, it's a bad idea. And, you know, where I live in Apple Valley, every Saturday, kids on dirt bikes, yep. five and six years old, sure. riding dirt bikes, right? What are we going to do? Start, start. No, you can't ride a dirt bike till you're 12. You can't. Right. What are we doing here? Right. Yeah. And and honestly, a lot of the Sacramento lawmakers can't answer that question. And they'll, they'll try and say, oh, well, you know, yeah, we get the parent choice thing. But, it's you know, you know, sometimes the government has to get involved. And yeah, sometimes the government has to get involved. But I can tell you this. You're not raising my child. You're not with my child every day. 
Right. You're not feeding my child. Right. You're not buying them clothes. You're not seeing their ups and downs in school. You don't know what's going on with my child sitting in your office in Sacramento. Right. So don't tell me what my kid can do and can't do. Sure. I love my kid more than you'll ever love my kid, right? And that that's truly the bottom line in all of this. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. There was a kid probably 15, 20 years ago, and his parents were promoting that he fly solo around the, the globe in like a Cessna, right? Oh, no. So he took off, landed, took off, landed, and, and something bad happened, right? Now, that's one of these anomalies where it's one parent, and I watch this, and I'm like, my God, I mean, send my 12-year-old kid in, in a small aircraft, right, to navigate, right. fly, take off, land, fuel, manage himself at, at that age. Now, this was obviously a pretty exceptional kid, but these are large swaths of people, right? If you've got 5.4 million uh, kids or and adults playing, mainly kids, yep. you've got at least 5.4 million parents, if not closer to 10 by the time by the time you're through the number somewhere in, in between there. But this has been going on for decades and decades. And yeah, there are the, you know, we've all seen a concussion movie. And some of that science has been debunked and some of it's accurate. Um, the NFL denied there was, you know, TBI and CTE and these things. And um, I think, you know, we learn as a society, we learn as studies are done, but we've not yet done a study to say, hey, comparing football kids to kids that haven't played any sport or played a lot of video games, who commits more crime? Who does a better job of parenting? Who has a higher median? We, we haven't done any of that yet. Yeah. And we haven't done the football kid versus video game kid in terms of what are the other proclivities that occur, right? Whether it's drugs or it's this or it's that. And I play video games. My kids play video games. You probably have too. Yeah. I don't have any issue with it, but I just really had an issue with the state. And, you know, that's why we tried to come out and, you know, publicly support. And I don't know if the other helmet companies did, but, you know, at some point you have to take a stand. Once it goes away, you it's impossible to try to get it back. It, you, it won't come back, Nick. I mean, if, if, if they ever get their hands on this and can make this happen, youth football, it's gone, yeah. right? And, and not only that, this is key. People don't understand this. And I think some of the high school head coaches in California are starting to realize this because they're seeing a drop in participation. Ever since this CTE talk started hitting the headlines, if you look back at the statistics, high school participation in California has declined every year since about 2015. Yeah. It's at the lowest level it's been in, in a long time. So if the state bans youth football for 12 and under, whatever age, what parent's going to say, oh, yeah, hey, you know what? I think you should go play high school football. Right. It, it doesn't correlate. Yeah. So all these guys, Nowinski himself, Chris Nowinski, oh, they should play high school football. Well, what, what's, what's safer about high school football? Isn't it the same sport? Sure. How can you say it's bad for an 11-year-old, but it's safe for a 14-year-old? Right. It doesn't make any sense, and the state should not be making laws based upon that. No, I agree, uh, and and that's a great point. It, on the, on the, the counterpoint of some of this, though, is an example is NOXI. So if you don't know what NOXI is, I don't remember what the acronym stands for. If you remember, it's like the National Organization for Safety and Sports Equipment or something like that. But but they govern all football helmets, right? So everything, every helmet like this has to pass a drop test. They come to your facility and ensure that. Uh, things are in order, the way you're handling your supplies, that you can do recalls, that you're doing quality testing, all of these different things, and you're held to a reasonably high standard. Um, that organization did two studies, one at Virginia Tech, one at the University of Ottawa, saying youth helmets should be under, for 14 and under, should be under three and a half pounds. Now, this is an industry-funded organization, so since we're the only ones and we're the smallest company that want these helmet or have the helmet that's under three and a half pounds. Everyone else is like, oh, let's do that in 2025. Let's do it in 2026. Yeah. We don't know which head form to use. How much should it weigh? You know, how bright should the light be and the temperature in the room when we test this? It's like, guys, we did a test. We know that that weight snapping around on your cervical structure is a negative, especially in a younger player. Think about this. If you have a six, 60 pound kid and he's wearing a six pound helmet, which isn't too far off. We have a competitive helmet that's five pounds, 14 ounces. It's one of the top rated helmets at Virginia Tech for youth, right? The reality is if I weigh 225 pounds, that's like me wearing a 22 and a half pound helmet. Can you imagine what a 20, 
five pound weight plate on my head would do when I got hit and slammed it around. You saw what it happened to Tua when he's wearing a five pound helmet versus three and a half pounds. Why are we not following this organization and why is no one pushing in that direction, right? That's what. Well, but that that's key, right? That stuff like that should happen, right? Let's, that's why we did AB1. It's the same thing. It's the same concept, right? Sure. We, we see the recommendations. So let's take those recommendations and make them happen. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you would know more about the, the helmet aspect of this, but yeah, what? Let's make things better. Let's not eliminate them. Sure. You know, and sometimes I think it just takes, it takes guys like yourself, guys like me doing this on this end to make this happen. Yeah. Because if we don't do it, nobody's going to do it. Yeah. It's just going to be the status quo. Yeah. You, you kind of just get, if you're a parent and you're at home and your son or daughter is not played tackle football, you might think you understand, but you don't understand until they play. Right. Right. You, yeah. You know, if you've played, you get it. If, if your son or daughter has played, even if you were hesitant, like my former wife was like, I don't know about this. And I'm like, your kid was playing ice hockey. He could get hit with the puck, <laughs> the boards, the stick, the pipe, you know, the ice, shoulders, elbows, fighting, you know, all of these different things. And, you know, we were worried about football at seventh or eighth grade. But as she watched, now she's a huge proponent of it, saying, man, it built up his confidence. He works and is friends with all different types of kids. Um, he really cares about the people that he plays with. He's got a brotherhood. I'm like, he's going to remember these kids for forever. And it's true. And if you don't want to play, that's fine. Or you don't want your, your son or daughter to play, that's fine. That's your own household decision. If you, a mom or a dad right now walked up to you at a dinner party and said, Steve, I am a little worried about my son or daughter playing football. Um, tell me why, you know, Sarah or little Steve should be able to, to, to play. What would you say to uh, mom or dad if that topic came up? I've said that many times because that question has been asked me over the years many, many times, even before all of this band stuff happened. Right? Yep. The one thing that I say to them is come out to a football practice or come out to a football game and hang out with me. That's a, and didn't think of that. That's pretty good. Yep. I could sit there for two hours and try and explain to them why they should let their kid play. Come to the field. Come out to the field and watch. Because I, I can guarantee you there might be some leagues that people are not comfortable with. Sure. Everybody's not doing everything right. I'm not going to sit here and say they are because that would be disingenuous on my part. Sure. Right? I agree. But if you're running a great organization and you're doing the best that you can for these kids, you get those parents out to your field. You bring them out and you let them be a part of that. And once they come out, I think I couldn't tell you how many parents I convinced to let their kids play. I, I've lost count, to be honest with sure. you, Nick. I mean, it's because once they see it and they see the practice and they understand what happens at a game, it's no different. I'll take your question and spin it. It's the same thing I would say to a lawmaker in Sacramento. What do you know about youth football? Well, not much. How are you going to ban it then? You can't ban something you don't know about. You need to come out. You need to go to your local district. And on a Saturday, you need to go to your Pop Warner. You need to go to your AYF. You need to go be a part of that youth organization. And you need to understand who those people are. And you need to know that they have hearts. And those people are parents volunteering their time to keep those kids active. Yeah. Learn the sport. Learn it. We're not talking about the NFL. I mean, everybody likes to... Everybody likes to talk about youth football like it's the NFL. It's not the NFL. It's not even close to the NFL. We're out there struggling and grinding, you know, and working the snack bar and right. <laughs> setting up the field at 5 a.m. in the morning, right? And staying there till 7 o'clock at night to clean the field up. And, you know, we love our kids and we take care of our kids and we want them to be a part of this great sport. That It's like what your wife said, right? How many stories do you hear about that? The ones that are like iffy on it. Sure. They're iffy. They're like, uh, I don't know. They do it, and it always turns out to be a positive on the parent. Absolutely. Absolutely. We, we were, uh, I was coaching, a, I think it was seventh, eighth grade maybe, Pop Warner. And, uh, you know, y y y people don't think about it. It's like, oh, the practice is 90 minutes long or two hours long. Now, well, it's when you leave work and you pack up, <laughs> driving there, any prep time, printing out plays, playbook, you know, getting your stuff put together. You know, 
all of these people. I was at the AYF uh, championships in Florida, and I'm sitting in there, and there's probably 400 people on a Saturday night. And I'm thinking to myself, and I told them, I'm like, you guys are all like heroes, right? You could be doing anything else on a Saturday night to your for yourself, going out to eat, having a cocktail, going to a movie, doing whatever you're going to do, and you're here for the kids. But coaching the kids was a big rewarding uh, component of my existence at that time too because, man, I mean, my kid, like anybody else, he has his struggles and his negatives along the way and positives along the way. But in general, he's in a good place. Some of these kids were were not in a good place. Yeah. We had a kid who had recently lost a, a father to a violent crime. We had another kid who had never played a sport before. And they're in totally different places. But by the end of the year, when these kids write you these letters, like I throw everything away, all birthday cards, Christmas cards, da, 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 da. I save the notes from these kids. And when I see them now, it's fantastic. And it's it's not anything that I did. You could plug any dad in there. My way of doing it might have been different. Your way of different. Yeah, that's true. But all of these people that care enough to give up five or six days a week of their free time to go and spend it with these kids, and they're in a highly supervised area with a whole bunch of other parents there, there's never a practice where, hey, your mom and dad can't come. All the mom and dads come, you know, and most of them, some never show up. But that experience for those kids is fantastic. Did you play as a you know as a kid when when you were growing up? You were here and or you were in Huntington Beach, right? No, no, no. I'm a, I'm a South San Diego guy. Oh, yeah. I graduated Montgomery High School back in 1990. Um, yeah, when I played uh, Pop Warner back in the day down in Imperial Beach, I mean it was it's not pretty. Now, now that I think back to those days and doing what I'm doing now with this, sure. I think, wow, how did how, how did they not ban youth football in 1985? Right. When, when you weren't, coaches were, you know, holding water from you and yep. grabbing your face mask those old days and, you know, yelling and screaming yep. at you. and The flinch drill, throwing the ball oh, at your right. face mask. Right? right? No, it was a different, it was a totally different world back then. And I look at it now and that's why I, I say to you and I say when I said to you about the lawmakers, I just think these guys have to be educated, Right. You know, there might be a few up there that have been involved in in, in sports on the local level, maybe youth football. But until you've been involved with this, this is why I stayed involved with this. You know, I mean, I played um, youth a little bit, played two years in high school, but I'm not a big guy. I just high school football wasn't my thing. Right. I I didn't make it. Um, And that's cool. I, I still love the experience of doing it. You know, both my boys, my youngest started at seven. My oldest at nine. My oldest played three years. That was it. Yeah, he didn't want to do it anymore, and that was his decision, not mine. Telling him, you know, you need to stay. You don't want to do it. That's cool. You're good. Go yeah. do what you want to do. My youngest played five years. They never went on to play high school football, um, and and that's not trying to get too much off track here. But I think about my boys in this experience. What about those kids that really can't play high school football? You know, high school football is a totally different game compared to what is going on at the youth level. It is. People don't realize that. It's completely different. You have weight room involved. Yeah. You got a lot of different things going on at the high school level compared to being eight, nine, and ten playing youth football. Yeah. What happens to those kids that might only play youth football? They'll never have that opportunity yeah. to put on pads or a helmet and experience this great sport if a ban happens. Because you can't the state can't tell you don't play youth football. You need to go play high school football. Maybe some don't want it. Sure. Or you physically can't. You know. You physically can't. Yeah. So that's that, there's a lot of different aspects to this, Nick. That yeah, I mean, a lot of people probably don't even think about. Yeah. Yeah. You see these. Uh, you know, the, the I go to youth league and it's uh, like an eight U. You know, eight and under, and the kids are you know vary in size and in in weight, yeah. but they're in the same zip code and. The, the collisions are not the type of violent collisions you see or you used to see more, more of them in the NFL. But the difference between youth football, if someone's listening to this and it's like, oh, well, isn't the same as high school? It's like, not really. You know, you make sure your kid's hydrated. He, he make sure he's got his mouth guard when he shows up in his helmet and his cleats. He shows up. He's there for two hours. He might stay 15 minutes longer to take some snaps or throw some balls or whatever else. And then he's done and he goes and does his homework and, you know, eats a cupcake and yeah. goes to sleep. The high school football, 
which had a little bit of the youth football edge to it 20, 30 years ago. But now, you know, the, if you're playing at a real school and you are at a competitive place, you're in the gym five or six days a week. You are going to camps on weekends. You're in seven-man passing leagues. Um, the season runs from, you know, May, where you're meeting with maybe your quarterback or whoever else to, to work on things. And this is after going to the weight room in the morning. And then if you're playing another sport, like it's a whole different world, specialized. And of high school kids, I think only five to seven percent actually go and play in college. So yeah, no, that's true, right? right? That's that's what this that's why this whole ban football thing, ban youth football thing is is it drives me crazy sometimes. The the numbers dwindle as you go up in level. Yeah. Because of talent, genetics, there's a lot of different factors why kids, a lot of kids in high school don't go on to play college football. They'll only play in high school or they play a couple years in youth or they only play youth because they're not set to play in high school. Sure. We can't we can't mold all levels of football together. Yeah. From NFL down to youth and say, oh, well, they're going to have these 22 year careers yeah. from youth to high school. Yeah. That's just those guys that do that, I think, are just phenomenally gifted genetically and you know uh, otherwise and 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 being able to have careers if you started playing at eight years old and you were lucky enough to be drafted into the nfl you're a special person yeah right yeah there's 17 or 1800 nfl players only in in a given year (laughs) and uh we were up at jordan palmer's uh qb summit and he had dtr and will levis and uh clayton toon and uh, max dugan from tcu and like watching Will Levis throw the ball, it was remarkable. Like this guy's like <laughs> six four, no body fat, and he's just throwing rockets at the full length of this gym. And he did, he's not even having to like use his whole body to throw the ball. And and it's remarkable to to see that. But the number of players at a D one level or at this level, and people watch that movie, the concussion movie, and they're like, you know, the Larry Webster thing or the Mike Duerson thing. Those are tragedies, but those are guys that played in the 70s. You played both ways. When you got dinged or you had a concussion, they sent you right back in there. There was no treatment for it. There was no protocol for it. There was no diagnosis for it. The coach was making that decision ad hoc. Man, we're only six points down. Can you can you go? Yep, I'll go out there. You weren't drinking enough water. The training wasn't the same. Completely different game. And that's not to say it's right. It just was. There's been a yeah. lot of things in all of our histories that ugh, you look back and you're like, gosh, we, we, we did things differently than in ter- today's perspective. But I think as a game, it's great for kids and they should have the opportunity and the parents should have the opportunity to make the decision. Hey, I want my kid to race go-karts or ride dirt bikes within reason. Right. right. Um, I don't want someone shooting an arrow at the apple on my kid's head as a sport. Um, but but there's got to be some point of. Uh, you know, empowering the, empowering the parents. So, well, you talk, <laughs> shooting the apple that you, you makes me think of some of the things that they bring up when they talk about banning youth football. They'll use, well, we don't let kids smoke, we don't let kids drink. I, I've heard, uh, oh, well, we don't let kids in tanning beds. I'm like, okay, I don't even know where where tanning beds comes into this whole discussion. But those are some of the things they'll throw out, right? Well, we don't let kids go to tanning beds under 18. And my thing is. What is the benefit of smoking? That, does anybody does anybody know what the benefit of smoking is? Because I haven't seen one benefit of smoking. Yeah, anybody just the, can... the the instant gratification of the nicotine hit. I guess that's about that's it, it, right? Yeah. There are a lot of benefits to having a child play youth football. Some of which which we've discussed already. Sure. There's benefits to it. So to compare it to smoking or drinking beer or laying in a tanning bed. You know, but the benefit of a tanning bed is you get tan. Okay, that's cool. But I understand why you wouldn't want a 10 year old maybe just, you know, frying their skin, which has been proven. There's no benefit to that. But there's benefits to playing youth football. And some of those benefits can't be shown on a research paper. You know, I'll give you an example. I mean, now that we're talking about this, there's there's been many times over the years where I've had a kid struggle, you know, and a parent come to you and say, Steve, I just, I just don't know what to do with him. Not doing his homework, you know, just just really struggling in school and loves coming to football practice, but just doesn't want to do good in school. I mean, I'd go to their house, right? I, I'd go physically to their house and sit down and help that kid do their homework. 
teach them that that's the right way. Sometimes as parents, we struggle with our own kids. Sure, right? absolutely. Right? And that it helps to have that outside help. Yeah. And I've seen such drastic improvement in children. And, and, and I mean, that's off the football field, but it, it all relates to what we do as coaches and, and volunteers in the sport, right? Um, the sport is great for them and builds them up too. But but just the other stuff that doesn't that isn't seen, sure that isn't publicly seen the, the stuff that you can't explain to a lawmaker. Yeah, you just can't explain that. Like, what do you mean you help them do their homework? Well, yeah, you help them do their homework. Yeah, and it's you take true. that time. Nobody yeah. tells me is paying me to go do that. Yeah, they're not. The the building of the kids' confidence too, and other sports can do that, but football seems to do it even for the kids that don't start or play that much, just because it's true. in practice you're having to do what everyone else is doing. And it's like, oh, holy shit, I can do that, right? I can do this. I have a breakthrough. And yeah, you know what? You're probably not going to be the starting quarterback, but you had a big breakthrough. And then you had another one. And then the kids started to respect you because before you were jumping off every time the snap count was on two. Now you're not, and you're making good blocks. And you have that feeling of acceptance. And there's no study that can be handed to somebody to reflect those things. And when it's affirmed, because they see it on Friday night at the high school game, Saturday night, the college game, and at the NFL game, um, and, and we tend to focus on the negative. Like people think, if you ask them how many uh, kids get, or, or how many fatalities are there in youth football year, y you'll get crazy numbers, thousands, hundreds, whatever. <laughs> it's like one or two, and the majority of time, it's somebody being overheated, congenital heart defect, or similar, yeah. right? Um, or somebody has a head injury, but there was something else going on prior to that. And that doesn't make those any less of a tragedy, but when we're looking at, hey, bikes, skateboards, all these other things, um, you know, we got to protect all these kids with better equipment but and better judgment. But you're putting kid into a structured environment for them to expand their horizons, how they work with other kids, et cetera. Um, in your uh, experience having played, your kids played, you've coached a lot of kids, uh, you know, do you think this also helps build communities because people get to know each other in a different way? Yeah, it's it's huge, right? And I relate this to high school football. What's the one high school sport that has that high profile Friday night lights thing, right? Sure. You don't see the high school baseball team out there under the Friday night lights. Yeah. There's a reason for that. Yeah. And I'm not putting down baseball because I love baseball. I'm a huge Padres fan, right? It's it's not it's not about putting down the other sports. Football builds community like no other sport can. And like we talked about how it builds, all those 11 players have to be on the same page. It builds that community up, right? Because you're you're going out there and you're representing Apple Valley, Carlsbad, you know, where, wherever you're at. And it doesn't matter that you're playing with the kid whose parents maybe own the multi-million dollar company, but your dad's the construction worker. Or your mom and dad are liberals and the other parents are conservatives. Yeah. You know, when you're on that football field, none of that matters. Yeah. No, none. It's... And that can be said about other sports. I get it. But there's something unique about football and bringing people together like no other sport can. It just, it just I, I haven't seen it. Yeah. Unless somebody has seen it and I, I, they haven't told me about it. I have not seen any other sport do what football has done for individuals, communities. Sure. And, and 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 young people as a whole. Yeah, yeah. Well, you look at like the makeup of the NFL, and it's a eclectic group. I mean, and it's great, right? You look at these college teams. I mean, I've been on the field at I don't know how many college games this last year, and you see all these kids of different backgrounds. It's just an it's such a non issue when you're out there, and I think that when you put a group of people through a crucible, through challenges and difficult times, they bond together. Right. If you had somebody that were they were stranded on an island, right, the, the Gilligan's Island, right, the, that group of people is going to be closer than if you just took them out of normal society and plucked them in, and put them in a shopping mall. And that's the same because the level of discomfort in football is higher. You're running more. There's, you know, the difference between injury and pain or injury and being hurt is yeah, I mean, you're using your body to advance the ball and somebody else is using their body to stop it. It's not incidental contact like uh, in some other sports. But 
there's a there's a, a a grit that comes with that, but a bonding of these kids and the parents and the team dads and moms and the coaches and the people that send out the email and the people on the other side of the field that brings communities together. So um, all these youth sports are great. Uh, I'm glad you've done all this hard work. If you had to talk to a parent who is a football parent now, and they're listening to this and they're in Dubuque, Iowa, or Flowery Branch, Georgia, or Odessa, Texas, what can they do to help the cause in general in, in terms of making sure that this doesn't get a foothold and that we're educating and, and proponents of the sport? It's a great question. Um, what, what football parents can do, whether it's youth or high school, because the youth and high school level are pretty connected because we're in the same communities. One thing we're gonna do here in California moving forward, and we've learned from this second experience, is that those involved with youth football or high school football need to become more politically active. Once, once they force you, and when, they, when I say you, once they force us as a youth football community into the political realm, we can't get out of it. We're in it now. Yeah. We're stuck in it, right? So how do, we, how do we grow from that and protect the sport and our choice as parents to play the sport? We have to become politically active. So if you have a youth football league, this is what we're going to do here in California moving forward. We haven't put the plans together yet, but this is just a general thought. You have your youth football league in Carlsbad here where your, your guys' headquarters is. That youth football league now needs to start being involved with the city council. It needs to start being involved with the county board. It needs to be engaged with the local assembly person. It needs to invite those people out to the youth football, just like I told you about the parents, inviting the parents out. You've got to start having politicians come to your youth football organizations. As crazy as that sounds, I've already talked to some people about this and they're like, well, why would I do that? I don't understand. I was like, you have to get them involved. There's, there's many reasons why. The biggest reason is youth football keeps being put up for a ban. Sure. And that's politics, you know? I know a lot of people don't like politics, you know? I mean, I did my voting and I had my opinions on certain things, but we're in it now. Yeah. We're in it. We're, we're, we're never getting out of it. We're stuck in it for, for good or bad, sure. whether it's writing bills that make the sport safer or stopping bans in the future. Yeah. Wherever you're at in this country, if you're involved with youth football, your league has the power to stop bans and tell politicians, no, we're not having it. Yeah. And you have to become politically involved. That's what, what leagues have to do moving forward. Sure. You got to invite your city council guy out for. I used to do this in Apple Valley, um, even before all this. You know, have have your local politician become a, be a guest referee. Yeah, or the the guest water boy, right? That's a great idea, right? No, but I mean, it, it's a great idea. But how do you get people involved if you don't invite them to the party? And they can't see what it's all about, right? Because right. everybody has a conscience, and you know, I will tell everybody that's listening to this too. We're in a state that's banning gas-powered lawnmowers right. that you can't potentially may not be able to have a gas fireplace or you know burnt stove in your house and you guys went and pushed back with an out of without a big budget and in the legislature to their uh, credit was like got a point we're going to put this on the back burner in the file so if you if you know that hey we're not going to get bulldozed over because you didn't. And and some of it was grit. Some of it was being smart. Some of it was uh, determination and having to come back and come back again, but also being involved. But your ideas are awesome. So, you know, if anybody's, if anybody's, the takeaway from this thing is this can happen in your state. At some point, it may happen in your state. Yeah. And the way to, to, to push back on it is to involve the politicians early on, right? A yes. little bit of a preventative medicine is always better than reactive. Um, but also you being involved and even when your kids are no longer involved, staying involved with the sport, because uh, I think that the, the the product of the kids coming out of football just makes the community better of any of the sports, right? So yeah, it's true. Well, if, you know, you've obviously, you're, you're a dad, uh, you know, you've been a coach, um, you know, you're, you're, you're a patriot, and here you're sitting having exercised the, you know, democratic process in a different way than just going and voting. 
or writing a check. And true. Uh, I think it, you guys have a website right now or is Facebook or, or social, what's the, where could people go to see and learn more? So we have multiple things going here because I'm involved with two organizations. So the Save Youth Football California Coalition is grassroots. Okay. That's just us rallying everybody together on a grassroots level. And that currently, the website we have for that is saveyouthfc.org okay. for that. And then we have the Facebook group where we have everybody kind of come together and we kind of communicate on this. It's Save Youth Football California Facebook group. And then with the California Youth Football Alliance, that's C-A-Y-F-A.org. And that's the alliance that's a nonprofit that is we use to help advance the sport and, yeah. and make it better. Okay. Well, I hope everybody at home, you know, goes and checks that out. And I would say if you're ever thinking of whether you should play football, you should not play football, you're vassaling, go out to the field, right? Isn't that the best yes. thing? Take your kids out to the field. And even if you approach one of the coaches before the game, nobody's going to get irritated. I mean, during the game's a bad idea. But before, <laughs> right. hey, I'm here with my son or daughter that's thinking of playing. And, yeah, you know, all of these different organizations are welcoming communities. And I think that's a that's a great idea. And you brought up so many good points today. Um, you know, when you look back at all of this, you, we're all going to get old one day and you're going to be like, gosh, you know, and whether it's this, you know, your whole existence, like, what do you want to be remembered for? Man, now you put me on the spot, Nick. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I can't answer. You know, it's funny. I can't answer that. I honestly can't answer that right now. You know, because I think I'm still in the heat of this. Sure. Right. Like we're still in the game. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We're, we're probably at third quarter, maybe fourth quarter. I don't know where this game is going to ultimately end. Mm -hmm. um, I hope it ends. Here's what I've said to Sacramento, and those who will listen to this. I believe our families are on the right side of history with this. I just, that's what my gut tells me and my heart tells me. So believing that, I think ultimately when this is all said and done, everybody looks back at this, they're going to look back and they're going to laugh and say, wow, what a, what a bad, you know, few years of trying to ban youth football, right? Sure. I just, that's, and as long as we can save this sport and not just saving the sport for just saving it, you know, but saving it for the option of parents and kids to choose it, it is so important. It, it's just it's just key for me. Yeah. I, I don't ask for one red cent to do this. I don't. I don't I don't want it. people so let's start a GoFundMe. I don't I don't need it. Yeah. I'll spend whatever money I have in my bank account to fight this. And well, that's a tribute to you and and Ron and all the other guys that have been involved with this and the parents that have helped out, the kids that have played and been a good ambassador of the sport after when they've yeah. left and adults. You know, we hear all of this stuff about college players or the NFL and they talk about the bad, but all of these NFL players, most of these college players that are visible, they have foundations, they do community works. You never hear about that stuff. And uh, it doesn't know, make good headlines. No, it right? doesn't. And, and they're all like great kids. Uh, and we all make mistakes. We all have stumbles. There's always somebody that's quote unquote that guy or that girl, right? But, um, you know, you guys have shown exemplary patience and, and managing the chess game well. So, you know, we're, we're happy that you're here. I know parents across the country that were like, man, can this really happen? You prove that, hey, you can push back against City Hall and, and win. Um, and right in this case, it's a deferral, right? You said you're going to be on the field for a while on this. Yeah, but, I think so. I mean, but hey, we're here. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're going to have you back as this, uh, um, you know, ramps up again and we go through different cycles and we'll help in whatever way we can. Um, you know, as we grow as a company, we, we have some more resources, but uh, we're here for you and uh, we're here for the kids uh, and, and the kids that are the ones that make the game and the parents are the ones that make the game. And, you know, you're one of them. So thanks again for being here. Appreciate you sharing your story and all your good work on behalf of the sport. Thanks, Nick. And we appreciate you supporting our cause because there's not too many in, in your industry that will come out and publicly support what we do. And, you know, you took a stand for the families of California, the youth football families of California. That that means a lot. Well, thanks. And I, I think that the, this circum, it goes beyond football in that it's for the parents. Their parents should be making decisions for your kids that government shouldn't. And this is one small cog in that bigger fight, but this is a, a small cog that hits close to both of us because our yeah. kids have played and I'm in that business. And, 
you know, you're involved with the kids still today. So uh, we'll keep working together on this. And again, thanks for being here. We'll have you definitely back again. Thanks again. Thanks, Steve.